So, uh, it says I'm live. So, sorry about the delay. I am still struggling with the new, uh, the new YouTube setup here. So I apologize, and I'm going to keep stalling until I get some confirmation that I'm actually, uh, that I am actually live. But it says I am. <laughs> oh, gosh. Please. Oh, there we go. I'm live. Yay. Okay. So my name is Mark Savatella. This is the MuseScore Cafe. Um, and uh, I apologize for all the technical difficulties getting up and running. But uh, it's, uh, it is just a process figuring this stuff out, I swear. Um, so my name is Mark Savatella. This is the MuseScore Cafe, August 26th, 2020. And this is my weekly series of chats where I talk about some aspect of making music using MuseScore and um, just uh, take questions, show things, demonstrate things, ask questions sometimes. You know, we do what we want to do. And I see lots of people here. Uh, so this is great. I'm going to try to uh, keep my eye on the chat here. Um, so uh, just uh, checking to see if I've missed anything in the realm of an actual like uh, question I need to answer. But hello to everyone that's here. So great to see so many people. All right. So um, the thing that I, I decided I wanted to talk about today was writing for wins. Um, and I often pick a topic that's just sort of whatever is on my mind that week. And I'm always looking for suggestions. And I've got a few kind of queued up um, that have come in. But uh, what I'm talking about today, I realized that one of the very first cafes I did was on talking about writing for the piano, which is my instrument. That's what I play, really. Um, and I have a lot of insight into writing for the piano. A few weeks ago, I did one on writing for guitar. Why? Because it had come up on the MuseScore forum, some issues, and I just thought it was an interesting topic. So I decided to talk about it. Then I realized, well, maybe I should just do a, a thing on other instruments. So today I'm going to do winds and uh, some future uh, week I will do strings. And then, you know, maybe we'll look a little more specific at a couple individual uh, instruments as we go along. But I, I just want to talk generally about writing for winds, by which I mean both woodwinds and brass. It also will apply to things like harmonica or, for that matter, bagpipes, I guess. Um, so I want to talk about some of just the general things that you might want to keep in mind when writing for wind instruments and and I'll show you how to do some certain things in MuseScore. So the first thing I want to do is just play you a little example. Uh, this is uh, so my wife Kari uh, is a school teacher and they just started school this week and so hi Kari if you're watching um, and uh, they started uh, this week, and they're starting via via Google Meet, actually. Um, so they are doing things virtually. But last year, when she started at this school, uh, Carson Elementary School, they started, uh, she wrote a school song, which has sort of been now her, uh, um, her thing. She's had the last, she's uh, been at a few different schools, and she's been writing school songs for them. So she wrote a school song, uh, and then they did a performance last year in which they had a guest artist uh, of, a, of a saxophone quartet, the Air Force Academy, uh, Air, Air Force Academy saxophone quartet came in. And so I decided I would arrange the school song for them to play. I mean, it was just a concert that they were going to do their own music, their own arrangements and everything. But we just sort of contacted them and said, hey, would you mind doing this? It might be fun. So um, I'm going to play you, uh, here's the score for it, and I'm just going to play you a little bit of that version because why not? It's fun, um, is what I say. Except now I have to find the thing. Here it is. Here we go.
So it goes on from there. That gives you the basic idea. Um, and here is the score for it. So I want to talk about some of the things that go on when you're writing for wind instruments, in this case saxophones. Um, but it, it applies, almost everything I, I'm going to say applies uh, in one way or another to pretty much all wind instruments. So let me just pull up the uh, uh, chat over here so I don't have to um, uh, keep looking over my shoulder when I want to switch to it. Okay, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> So one of the things to be aware of is here the concert pitch button is checked, meaning I am I am looking at what I'm hearing. In other words, this is an F. And if I went over to a piano and played an F, or if you have perfect pitch, you will agree that that is an F. Well, uh, that is all well and good. And I write music this way because I want to write what I think I'm hearing. But many, maybe even most, wind instruments actually don't play the notes that are written. What do I mean by that? If you ask a saxophonist to play an F and they put their fingers down on the, the keys that are supposed to be an F on a saxophone, what actually comes out of their horn is not an F, it's an E flat. A uh, soprano saxophone sounds a step lower and alto saxophone sounds a major sixth lower. Tenor saxophone sounds a whole step and an octave. Baritone sax sounds a major sixth and an octave. So you have to transpose the music when writing for these instruments. Like you see the baritone sax is actually playing these notes here that I've written in bass clef because they're low notes. But that's not how they're going to read it. So I write my music with concert pitch turned on and an awareness of what their relative ranges are. But then I turn the concert pitch button off and now I can see the music that is what they are going to actually see. And uh, so I wrote that all in a score here, so all saves together. But then I went to File, uh, Parts, and hit the All Parts button, and it just generated a part for each of my four instruments. And the parts are always going to be transposed. So uh, even if my score was concert pitch, I'm going to go back to that because that's how I prefer to see it, um, the parts will be in other keys. So in concert pitch, all my instruments were in the key of F, right? One flat. But each of the individual parts you see is now transposed. The soprano sax is in G, alto sax is in D, and so forth. So MuseScore is going to handle that transposition for you, but you have to get the details right about it. You know, you have to make sure you're in uh, concert pitch mode when you're writing at concert pitch or be not in concert pitch mode when you want to see what they are actually going to see. So that's something to be aware of when you're writing for transposing instruments. Uh, so then each of these instruments has a different range and that's an important uh, consideration also that when you're writing when you write for piano I mean it's got 88 keys you, you pretty much write whatever you know whatever note you want and it's going to be fine when writing for most other instruments though they can't play all those 88 notes uh, some of them well some of them can maybe now I don't know that there's any instrument that you would want to write for that can play either higher or lower than a piano um, maybe some sort of electronic instrument. But most instruments can only play within a certain range of maybe two, three octaves of usable range on that instrument. So you really have to know what these ranges are. And MuseScore will do things for you, like what you can see here. <clears throat> this low C is colored. I might call it uh, green, but it's actually called a dull yellow officially. Um, and I know that from painting also, that if you darken a yellow, it starts to look green. You mix black into yellow, basically it gets green. So um, this is the lowest note a baritone saxophone can play, and it's marked green because not all baritone saxophones can play that note. It's low C concert. If I turn off concert pitch, you'll see it's a low a in treble clef. Uh, that's a, an interesting little quirk of baritone saxophone that when you uh, switch between concert pitch and regular pitch or transposed pitch, um, the lines and spaces stay the same, just the clef changes and maybe accidentals uh, change. That's a kind of quirk of how, how um, you, how baritone sax uh, transposes. So 
that low A requires a specially built baritone saxophone. When I say specially built, I mean like most baritone saxophones for the last, I don't know, 30 years, I don't know when it became common, uh, maybe 50 years even, uh, come with a low A. But older baritone saxophones, which are still in common use, do not necessarily have a low A, and probably someone still makes a baritone saxophone that doesn't have a low A. So we color this note in MuseScore so that you know Mm, be careful about that. When you're right, if you write that note, they may or may not to be able. They may or may not be able to play it. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, but another thing is not just knowing what's playable or not, but knowing what's what the extremes of the ranges sound like. Low notes like this low note, that low A is so fun on baritone sax. It's it's a it's it's a good honk is what it is. Um, let's actually hear the baritone saxophone on the recording. Did you hear? Can I sing? Yeah. There's that note. So watch that guy there, the baritone saxophone. I'm pointing to the screen, but it's this guy here. You're going to hear it there. So I don't know if you can hear it with everything else going on, but it's that. It's that kind of honk. It's a pleasant honk, <laughs> uh, if, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, other instruments, though, you get to the low end of their range, and they're not, they don't really have that extra oomph that you might want them to have. They might sound kind of weak. They might, like trumpets, when they get low, they just sound kind of weak. Uh, there's other instruments, oboes. Uh, I, I heard it like likened to a duck sound that comes out of an oboe when it gets low. So different instruments kind of have different qualities in their lowest range. A clarinet's lowest note is is just another note. It doesn't actually sound particularly louder or softer. It's got it's a pleasing note, but it doesn't have any additional special qualities or if if it if they if it does, it's subtle. So uh, that's something to be aware of. On the other hand, the upper end of the range, like when you take uh, a tenor saxophone up to the top of the end of the range, it's got its own little sound. Uh, here it comes with the tenor player here. So he kind of squeaked a little bit because his <laughs> reed was dry at that point when we recorded this. But um, that's something to be aware of also, that the ind individual sounds. Trumpets at the upper end of their range get very powerful, loud, uh, some might say shrill, uh, but it's it's a very powerful sound that can be overwhelming unless you have an entire band underneath it supporting that sound, and then it can be a very powerful sound. And if you're writing for classical musicians, typically what they'll tell you about trumpet is somewhere just above the staff is the upper range. Like they'll tell you the C above the staff as written for trumpet, which is really concert B flat. Uh, that, they'll tell you, is the highest note to write for trumpet, and that may be a D, but oh boy, the, you have better be careful about that when writing in an orchestral context. Well, for a jazz player, that's really just the starting place. At least the, the person who's going to play the highest part in a jazz band can play a high C. They can probably play a D, an E, an F, and a G above that. I would say the G is then the point at which only some specialists can get higher than that G. But pretty much anyone who plays in a jazz big band, uh, and um, yeah, anyone who plays in a jazz big band setting and is the lead trumpet player, the top trumpet player, can probably play up to a high G uh, with no particular difficulty. So hi to all the, the people who are just showing up, and it's just good to see so many people here. So um, yeah, those are some of the com the some of the uh, things that I wanted to talk about in general about writing for instruments and being aware of their ranges. If you try to write a note, by the way, that's completely out of the range, like if I take that note down a step, you'll see that now it is in fact red. I have to unselect it because when it's selected, uh, it's actually uh, gets black or blue or some other color. Um, but when it's not selected is when you'll see, oh my gosh, a, that A flat, that's below what a saxophone, what a, a baritone sax can play. So um, as a result also of the transposition, notice how the concert pitch version here had one flat in the key signature, 
but the transposed version had sharps. Well, that's what happens when writing for uh, wind instruments. Um, when you're writing for uh, soprano sax, it sounds a whole step lower, so a concert C sounds like B flat. Well, that means the key of C becomes the key of B flat. So, I mean, it actually, yeah, but then it works in reverse. So if you want to hear the key of B flat, you have to write the key of C because it sounds lower than written. So if you write a C, what comes out is B flat. So if you want to hear a B flat, well, you have to write a C. So in this case, I wanted to hear an F, and therefore I needed to write a G. And again, I wrote F. I really did. I wrote F because I wrote with concert pitch on. But when I go to print the parts, they will be in G. MuseScore is going to take it up a step for me. But because the key of F has one flat, the key of G has one sharp. It got sharper. If you think about the circle of fifths and how keys kind of add, you know, you have flatter keys and sharper keys on the circle of fifths, saxophones add sharps. The soprano and tenor sax will add two sharps. Alto and baritone sax add three sharps. Trumpets add two sharps to the key, or take away flat, same thing. So if you wrote the key of E flat, a trumpet would be reading the key of F from three flats to one flat. So whatever key you think you're writing in, all, most of these wind instruments are going to see fewer flats than what you wrote. So if you wrote flats, they're going to say, oh, this just got easier. I've got fewer flats to read. But if you wrote in a sharp key, suddenly they're going to have to look at more sharps. So we tend to avoid writing in sharp keys when we write for wind instruments. I, you don't like completely never do it, but it is something you think about. Uh, not writing, if you have a choice between writing in the key of A or the, right, or the key of B flat, most wind instruments are much going to prefer writing in the key of B flat. Because if you write in the key of A with three sharps, that poor baritone saxophone player is going to have to read six sharps. And the uh, alto, uh, and same with the alto, the soprano and tenor will have to read five sharps. It's a lot of sharps to read. They would much rather you write in B flat because now it's the key of C for them, uh, or the key of, or the key of G for alto or berry. So that's one thing to be aware of is that they're going to have to read more sharps. So that's a lot of just talking about keys and transposition. There are so many more things to talk about, but but that's one of the things that I realize that people who don't write for wind instruments often don't have any concept that this is a thing because very few other instrument families have this going on. Piano, we don't transpose. Guitar, I guess there's a concept of capo, but that's the guitar player's job to worry about. You don't normally write for guitar thinking about capo. Um, and most and none of the stringed instruments transpose. Li technically, both guitar and bass sound an octave lower than written, but at least it doesn't change your concept of keys. So this whole business of working with concert pitch is really a thing that um, doesn't come up unless you're writing for wind instruments. So it's really, if you don't have experience writing for wind instruments, this is good information. Well, I do have you know quite a lot of other things that I want to talk about. Most of them are, are much smaller details, not big conceptual things. Uh, so one of them is uh, something that has to do with what the instruments are capable of based on the physical mechanics of how you play that instrument. So if you think about uh, woodwind instruments like flutes, which aren't wood, of course, they're metal. Saxophones aren't wood either, but the reed is wood. Clarinets are maybe plastic, but often wood. So I don't need a woodwind, whatever. It's just, that's just the name of the family. But um, they mostly produce notes by lifting your fingers up or putting your fingers down. But you play a scale basically like this, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Pretty much every wind instrument uh, does something like that to play a scale. Brass instruments, though, usually have valves, and so it's like C, mm, brass players are going to have to correct me here because I really don't remember my patterns, and then D is these two valves, E might be this guy, uh, F might be these two. I'm making stuff up at this point, really. I don't know. Uh, maybe that one's F. And then G is open again. A is these two. I mean, there's like, it's like this pattern that almost feels random. It's not random. It's connected to the overtone series. Uh, so uh, any brass players want to be uh, filling me in, have a ball. But on trombone, so there's basically 
you know, eight different patterns that you can make, all open, all closed, all down valves, or, you know, each valve one at a time. This one's almost never used. That one's almost never used, all three down. But each combination, but this one, first valve down, second valve down is used a lot. First and second is used a lot. First and second and third a lot. And first and third are used a lot. On trombone, those patterns basically con uh, are called the seven positions. And I'm backing up so I can extend my arm. I think you, hopefully you can see, <laughs> but uh, those same patterns that are on trumpet or any valved instrument like a French horn, uh, those pattern or tuba, those patterns of valves correspond to the positions of how far out you pull your slide on a trombone. So there's only seven basically patterns that you use, eight technically, but seven that we use uh, regularly. and there's more than seven notes and so what you do is you end up repeating some of those patterns but then you tighten up your lips to make higher sounds and so there's like a limited range of notes that you can make with those seven patterns with any given lip position let any given embouchure uh setting so with your lips at a certain tightness you can play like seven different notes and then to make the next seven notes higher than that you got to tighten up your lips a notch well what this means and it's like maybe called a register um, is i think the term that they would use e is first and second f is just first thank you i i but d was first and third is that right i think so um so and then b is just second i think you know i i and it's different the next octave up right uh that changes because then at some point e becomes open again uh so that becomes a thing too but um uh i think that might only be in the upper octave so this means that there's like certain notes that you can, certain patterns you can play without having to change your lip position. But then to cross that break, you have to tighten up your lips some, and it makes certain things harder to do. Certain leaps are harder to accomplish because now it's it's about it's not just putting a finger down; it's making a fine adjustment in the tightness of your lips. And brass players learn to do that. But if you are playing a line that's just basically constantly switching back and forth between a uh, lip, between these registers, it's hard to do. So like arpeggios are not necessarily an easy thing on most brass instruments because it's this coordination both of the fingers and of the lip in a way that it's not on uh, woodwind instruments or piano or stringed instruments where it's not nearly as physically difficult. Uh, so wind, woodwind instruments have, like after you hit the end of the C, then you start over again, but you put your thumb down to play, uh, play an octave key. And so there is one little break there that happens, but it's nowhere near as bad as what brass players have to deal with. So there's uh, basically certain arpeggio patterns are kind of harder to do on brass instruments. And what this means is there's certain, and even on woodwind instruments, it's not as easy, like on piano, I can just go, and I just put my hand down and wiggle my fingers to play an arpeggio. On a guitar, I put my fingers on the right pattern of frets, and then I just pluck the strings here to play an arpeggio. Uh, on a, on a, a cello, often I can do the similar sort of thing. Put your fingers on the fretboard and then just bow across the strings, and you get those notes without a lot of work to it. So there's some instruments in which arpeggio patterns work really well. But other instruments, like most wind instruments, and especially brass instruments, really they have to work a lot harder to play arpeggios. Uh, okay, thank you for the uh, A is one and two, B is two. Yeah, I had that right. D. Okay, good. I had I had I had uh, all those right. So um, so uh, yeah, the this comes in because when you're going to write for these instruments, you really have to think about how you're going to do this because there's certain things you might write in music that feel comfortable to write like when i wrote reunion for piano which you've heard many times if you've attended these cafes this this is it's easy to play on piano i okay it takes some practice yeah but it's playable it it lays very well is the term we sometimes use it 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 it, it was i wrote it at the piano and so lar largely it just sort of falls under my fingers pretty naturally but this little pattern boom 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 
this is G, D, A, G, F, E. And then this little pattern here. If I were to want to arrange this for, say, a brass choir, I might be tempted to have tell to say, oh, this is the tuba or this is the trombone, whatever your lowest instrument is in your choir. But this is not the kind of stuff you want to make a trombone player or a tuba player play. It just isn't. So I'm not saying you can't ever write arpeggios, but you maybe have to think about other ways of doing things, like maybe splitting it up, maybe just having boom, bum, boom, bum, sorry, boom. Boom, bum, and then have the next guy going bottom. So there's things like that where you stagger these entrances to build arpeggios that way. There's all sorts of techniques like that that can be used to try to make your uh, patterns lay a little bit better and not be as awkward to play on these uh, instruments, especially brass instruments. I would say I wouldn't. I wouldn't hesitate too much to give, say, a bassoon player or a bass clarinet player this line here. Boom. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble clicking because I need to zoom in a little more. Um, so that pattern, uh, hand score. That pattern is not hard to play on most woodwind instruments. So there's that. Um, yeah, and, and it's also the case that for every woodwind instrument, there's idiosyncrasies. I said the basic C major scale is just li lifting up your fingers, but the world isn't C major scales, right? There's all these little side keys, and on recorder, there aren't side keys. There's special things if you want to get accidentals. You do things where you either half cover a hole or you skip a hole and then put things down, and all of these create their own idiosyncrasies that you kind of have to learn about also. So in order to write really well for any given woodwind instrument, it really helps to play it. But it also helps. So you can just read a book on orchestration that'll tell you about some of these idiosyncrasies. Yeah, and so trills where you have to rapidly go back and forth. This is really easy if I just want to go before between E and F. But if I want to go between B, if I want to go between say uh, this C and that D, that you can't do. So you use special fingerings to kind of fake that D or fake that C at the other end, or on clarinet, it's B is where the break happens, but I think saxophone, it's at, B, at C. And you have so all sorts of things like this to be aware of that are, you would think, oh no, there's just two notes next to each other on the piano, but they might not be next to each other. On trombone, this A and that G, um, I don't know, I'd have to think about it, but it could well be that the A is way down here and the G is up here just because of where it fits in where your embouchure break is. So not only might you have to tighten your embouchure, but you might have to do a little of this. But then again, there's like false fingerings. There's ways of faking it. So because there's often you can play the same note in a couple different places. Anyhow, there's tons of details like that to be aware of. And a good orchestration textbook. In fact, you notice, by the way, my background now is a bookcase. I decided blank wall was getting old. Um, I don't like how I look on Zoom calls. So I repositioned myself. But this is the textbook that a lot of, this is the college course that I took when I got my master's in uh, composition. Um, there you go, I have a master's in composition. It's called The Techniques of Orchestration by Kent Kennan and Donald Grantham. This is a very popular textbook on orchestration. There are many others, but it will, it'll talk about some of these details. It doesn't go into really huge detail on each idiosyncrasy of each instrument, but it tells you a lot of the things you might need to know in order to write effectively. So just knowing that there's certain things like wide intervals are hard on brass, like going just going up and down, bum, 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 on piano, I just put my finger in there and rock. On saxophone, it's just Boom, 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 boom. And just like my voice cracked there, a saxophone might crack too. You might you might crack going back and forth just by putting your thumb on and off because it's changing it's changing the reed vibration is changing in the same way that your embouchure does here. Um, but in any case, um, uh, on brass, going up and down octaves like that is is again just more difficult to play these wider intervals. So that's something there. Um, the other things that th there are so many things to be aware of, <clears throat> but I want to talk about a few others now getting more and more specific. Uh, one of them is the need to breathe. 
right? This piece here <laughs> has perhaps not a single rest in it. No, it's got rests in it, but there's no place where I'm not playing at all. It's uh, the only rests that happen in this piece are like when one hand is playing and the other one isn't, or two notes are being played together, but then more notes come in in the middle of, of the piece. There's no, in the middle of the measure. There's no place where like my hands are completely off the keys. You can't do that for winds. You can't ask the winds to play for 23 measures straight uh, without breathing. Now, they will take breaths, no doubt. They will take a breath. They'll find a place to sneak a breath if you don't give them a rest. At least this guy, whoever gets this part, he has that A flat and then gets a rest and then the G, he's got a built-in breath there. But they'll find places to take breaths and they will maybe mark up the score to figure it out if you don't place those breath marks in there for them. But uh, realistically, you might want to think about like, not making their job so hard and actually give them some rests. And in particular, if it goes on long enough, even those, because you have to take a little short breath. You're going, I took a really fast breath. Boom. Yeah, whatever. I don't have perfect pitch, so I'm not going to pretend. Boom, boom, do, 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 do. So I took a really quick breath in there, and you can do that. But if you only have the op if if that's all you get are those little quick breaths, that's not enough oxygen for the brain. It really isn't. Um, and at some point you start going dizzy. Uh, if that's all you get, if you never get to actually completely exhale and completely inhale again by having a longer break. That is something I wrote an arrangement uh, of a hymn. It was a four voice hymn. <laughs> it wasn't a rest in the whole piece. And I wrote this thing and it was like, you know, 32 measures long. And I wrote it for a wind ensemble and the trumpet player, one of them took me aside and said, no don't do this. Uh, let us share the parts, you know, let do this. And he kind of, kind of uh, gave me some clues as to how I might do that a little more effectively. Um, so that's something to think about also is going out of your way. So if I look at to, to provide these reps, so when I look at this piece, the thickest texture I have here is right at this very point. I have one, two, three, four, five, six voices at once. I think that's the thickest texture. Some other places where I have five voices at once. Well, if I wrote this for, if I want to try to write this for, say, a brass quintet, which is a fairly common instrumentation, um, I might think, oh, I can do that, and I only have to, um, you know, find, uh, leave out one note of this chord. But the reality is there might be places where I have to sacrifice notes elsewhere just to let people breathe. Like, and maybe just trade off. Like, don't assume that this melody is going to be the first trumpet all the time. Let the first trumpet rest and let the second trumpet take that melody. Because right here, I don't need all five voices. Oh, I need all five voices right here. But for a couple of beats, I don't need all five voices. So maybe trade off on when it thins down who is actually playing and who isn't. In a brass quintet, all the sounds of the brass instruments are similar. First and second trumpet are certainly like ideally essentially interchangeable, but yeah, they sound di trumpet sound different than horn and horn sounds different than trombone absolutely. But the colors aren't as different as they are in woodwind groups. In woodwind groups, the sound the difference between a flute and an oboe and a bassoon is huge or at least a clarinet. Flute, oboe and clarinet is huge compared to the difference between different brass instruments. So the because one is no read, one is a single read, one's a double read. And uh, so that's something you can kind of use in your orchestration, thinking about the colors of these things. When do I want this melody to be played by a flute versus a clarinet versus an oboe? And not maybe changing the color in the middle of a line without good reason, but then maybe look for opportunities to go out of your way to change colors. Maybe say, oh, I'm going to put the flute on top for these first four measures, but then put the oboe on top for the next four measures there just for a change in color. So that's uh, definitely something uh, something that we do when when writing for wind ensembles. Now, wind I say wind ensemble, wind ensemble is a thing. And by the way, uh, this is an arrangement here that a, a high school student uh, that I met um, did. 
uh, of the Rite of Spring, which was originally an orchestra piece, and he wrote it for a wind ensemble. Um, well, maybe, yeah, I, I don't know if he considers it a wind ensemble or a concert band, but it's a, a some sort of band, uh, some sort of ensemble that's just winds and percussion, and it's pretty amazing, so i got to play a little bit of this for you. Anyhow, it goes. It goes on. It's it's the full right of spring. Uh, I could, you know, it's a Stravinsky piece if you're not familiar. Um, and just jump to some random place and let you hear. So there's just other stuff going on in here. It just goes on, and he's really done a fantastic job of taking things that were originally written for strings and winds and redoing it for winds only. And of course, he also then gets at his disposal saxophones, which weren't in the original as far as I know. Um, I don't think they were. Um, so uh, there's a, a lot you can do by thinking about the colors of these things. What what brass sounds like in general versus woodwind in general. And then within the woodwind family, what the single reeds versus the double reeds versus the uh, the flute family. I don't know. What do you call that? The pipe family, maybe? Um, but it's the it's the ones that the reedless uh, woodwinds. So and, and figuring where do you want any given uh, thing to be played by a given instrument because you think you like how that's going to sound. The, the opening, if you're not familiar with the original, it does very famously begin with bassoon exactly like that. Yeah, so that, yeah, absolutely. Barry Sax and bassoon have, have totally different colors even though they have the same range. One is a single reed, one's a double reed, and that makes a huge difference right there. Even within the single reeds, though, yeah, bass clarinet and Barry Sack sound different, too. They both have a single reed, but the design of the instrument just makes them sound different. And getting familiar with the sounds of these instruments is, uh, you know, you can you can use the playback within MuseScore to get a rough idea of things, but it, it, it really helps to have at your disposal real, instrument, real uh, musicians to play this stuff so you can really hear what it sounds like. Um, it, that's why it was so fun when I wrote my... Uh, saxophone uh, quartet piece. Let me make the tempo here actually be more, I think they played it around 120. So, you know, that's computer playback versus the real thing. So yeah, the computer gives you a rough idea, but you know, then there's the realities of what the real instruments sound like. Um, usually it's much better if the players are good. If the players are not as good, they might have intonation, they might be out of tune, you know, they might play wrong notes. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong when writing for real musicians, no doubt. Um, but in any case, you, you want to think about these colors of these things. And usually we tend to keep sections together, right? We write for these saxophones together, even in a big wind ensemble like that. We we give all the saxophones a similar thing to play. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go to one of my big band arrangements now because I, I know exactly what I'm looking at here. Um, if I go to one of my big band arrangements, you'll see that very often I have stuff where like you can see here that the trombones have a uh, together, this half note, and then that tied over note. So the trombones are working together as a section, and then the trumpets work together as a section here. Although in this case I brought the baritone saxophone in. That's a pretty typical thing also, to bring the baritone saxophone in along with the bass trombone. They are both in the same range, and they very often have parts that kind of double each other. They don't throughout the whole piece, but they might in certain places. And then there might be some places where then just the saxophone section works together. And then when you're writing for a section of instruments, there's a whole series of techniques you learn on how to voice chords for that section. So when you have a moving line like this, there's that line. Uh, that's the melodic line, but everyone Ooh, da, ba, da, 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 da. I 
was singing a B flat. But then the other instruments are playing the same rhythm but different notes because each one of these is a chord. And then I'll let this one or this one. Right? It's a chord being sounded, but each instrument in that family has a different note in there, and there's different kind of techniques that we learn for how to how to voice the that chord among the different notes within an instrument family, and there's particular techniques that work well when writing for a saxophone section versus because uh, the saxophone, the very the very sax is much lower than the alto saxophones, it's an octave lower, but all the trumpets are in the same register so you you can space your notes out more when writing for saxophones but you can't space your notes out that much when writing for trumpets trombones you generally are technically you don't space them out that much either but typically you do because you'll let the bass trombone player be a lot lower than everyone else and te most bass trombones if they're playing a real bass trombone actually can play lower than everyone else it's not literally the same instrument being played the bass trombone is a separate instrument but in a lot of bands the the person playing this part doesn't own an actual bass trombone and is just playing a regular trombone so they have to adjust and take things up an octave sometimes. So those are other things to have to think about. Um, there's so many things I could just go on and on and on, but there's one big one that I haven't talked about that I feel like I really need to talk about, and I want to go back to uh, the Carson Cougar uh, song and take a look at this. And this is the idea of articulation, specifically tonguing versus slurring. All wind instruments I think, have this distinction where you either, do I have, no, I don't have my melodica handy, dang it. Um, uh, can I blow into this? No, okay, that doesn't work. Um, but <laughs> with a wind instrument, you blow, right? You're, you're blowing and lifting your fingers and the pitch changes, and that's called slurring. When you just blow, while lifting your fingers and let the finger change do every all the work for you. But there's another thing that happens on wind instruments where you go ta 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 it's not really ta where you use your tongue to kind of clearly enunciate each note. You're gonna need to do that if you want to repeat a single note. You can't well, you can just sort of use an F sound, I guess. It's uh, called a breath accent. Um, but it's, it's, it's sort of a different thing. So with wind instruments, there is distinction which notes you tongue versus which ones you don't. And you can, uh, all, you, 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 uh, I don't know how to, how to put this, but it's, this is like an essential thing that wind players want to know. Every single note that they play. Am I tonguing this or am I slurring it? So you want to think this through and where are you going to write in the slur marks here it's really crucial on piano that's like a whatever I, it, it gives me some vague idea of what shape you want me to give the music but realistically i could figure that out i'll do it my i'll, I'll do my own thing anyhow i'm not saying i don't pay any attention to those phrase markings but they're not really important they are crucial for a wind instrument to tell you when you're tonguing versus slurring. And it's an important distinction. You can't just tell them, I'll oh, just slur everything or tongue everything, because you can't slur forever. You gotta stop and breathe sometimes. And you also can't slur repeated notes. And sometimes you just want that sound of the tongued note. But there might be other places where you don't. Like, why on earth did I say, ta, 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 ta? I have no idea. Why didn't I slur these four? I actually don't know. I probably should have gone. Doo -doo. So in Muse Score, I select the notes, press S, it slurs them. There you go. Um, I don't know why I didn't slur those, because this is the kind of passage that should be slurred. So, um, yeah. So yeah, that as I was saying, that within a section, you're you're going to treat saxophones as a section. But sometimes it's nice to mix the sounds. Also, you can get really interesting sounds by taking two of the saxophones and two of the trumpets and having them kind of play together as if they were a section. Uh, Duke Ellington is associated with that in the jazz world, um, as within the wind ensemble world. 
it, it's sort of a coloration technique that different any people who write for wind ensemble um, probably do like probably Alfred Reed and some other people have really kind of explored these possibilities but um so I don't know why, frankly, because this dee, 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 that totally feels like something I should have had him slur, and I totally don't know why I didn't. Um, so I feel like I should have, uh, I should have slurred that and, and didn't. But so, but there's some things like sixteenth notes. You, if if it's a, da, 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 it's I'm not saying it's impossible to slur a scale in sixteenth notes, but I mean to tongue it, but it's going to sound weird and choppy. And the thing is, mu score can't represent that difference. So you're not going to hear it in Muse score. You're going to have to rely on the fact that, because Muse score is going to essentially tongue everything. We don't have a separate sound of wind instrument slur. We don't have that built in. Maybe for Muse score 4. Hopefully for Muse score 4, that'll be there. So you want to figure out where to put the slur marks and then where people are, because they will breathe between the slurs. Um, like here, if, if necessary, they could have breathed here. But there's also a thing that slur can be hard to do across a jump uh, because you, that means your fingers have to come up really together because if the fingers start to come up anything other than all together between that D and that G, you're going to hear the other notes in between there. If you tongue in between there, your finger can be a little sloppier. So there's considerations like that that I'm not going to say you don't ever slur across our across arpeggios or across no you do slur across arpeggios but wider intervals sometimes those make good uh places to start a new um a new tongue thing at the beginning of a phrase like that just to get a really clean start on it to make sure you're not getting any bleed from the fingers coming up on the previous notes. So just which notes are tongued and which ones are slurred is important, but also wind players more so than just about anyone else, like, you know, between piano, guitar, strings, and winds, wind instruments, you're going to see, you're going to want to give them more articulations in terms of marking notes, staccato, putting accents on things, and really going out of your way to, to note uh, dynamics and things. It's important for everyone to be sure, but it's maybe that much more important for winds because you really get different sounds. It's not just louder, but it's like a different attack that that comes from how you tongue this note with an accent. Um, this tenuto here that, that there might be a the, the the way you tongue these notes here with the the tenuto marking is a lighter tongue than it is otherwise so there's all sorts of things that cause you to want to um uh be really specific about your articulations and it makes a really nice effect when you have especially uh wind instruments uh articulating tightly uh because there's just something about that staccato sound of what it sounds like for a bunch of wind instruments together to all um, to all play staccato together. Like I'll just keep playing this thing because I know there's plenty of examples. Ah, that one wasn't. The ba da da da. Y'all hear how that went there, right? I'll back up just a little bit. Ba -da -bum. So that type of sound is so important to how you write for wind. That there's long, 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 short, dong. I'm not saying you can't write stuff like that for stringed instruments or for piano, but there's something about the crispness of how wind instruments achieve that because you can literally stop the sound with your tongue in a way that on piano, you lift your finger up and a damper comes up and gently caresses the string <laughs> to stop. And on uh, violin, you can take your bow off the string, but it keeps vibrating a little bit. On guitar, you pluck that string and it vibrates about as long as it's gonna vibrate. Yes, you can stop that string again, but it's not something, you don't write that kind of technique every other note, every third note like you do for winds. For winds, you write those articulations all the time. At least you do if you want to really write in what's called an idiomatic way, right? To really feel like you're writing for string uh, winds, to make it really feel like this is how, how people write for, for winds and make it really sound like writing for winds. So that's something else um, to be aware of. 
Um, I'm just going to just mention a couple final things. Um, I already mentioned range uh, issues. Uh, balance issues also in that being aware that goes with it. I, it is something I forgot when I talked about this before. I talked about how like certain low notes on trumpets maybe don't really sound like the low notes on a trumpet are nowhere near as loud as the high notes. Uh, other instruments, it kind of works the other way around. And so you kind of want to know how that works as far as, you know, where the loud notes are, where the soft notes are, so that when you're balancing these things, or just some instruments being inherently louder than others, you know, if you have a trumpet and uh, in the middle range and an oboe in the middle range playing together, the trumpet's probably going to be louder. And a trombone in the same range, playing a trombone playing this note here, well, actually, this note here, G, that's F concert for trombone, it's this F note. You hear, that's even my voice, right? Hear the difference in my voice between F. I have to strain to get that note. Well, so does a trombone. It's not much of a strain, but it's because, um, uh, yeah, but it's it's towards the top of a trombone's range. And you will be able to hear that. And it will come out louder and more strained. And it's going to balance very differently than a soprano saxophone playing that exact same note. So that's something else to be kind of aware of, is how the different instruments balance. Um, then, uh, yeah, really that's the main things that I really wanted to talk about. I guess there's a, a, a final thing that I didn't, I don't want to get into too much of, but I want to show you in MuseScore. There's all sorts of special techniques that uh, wind players can do. And I did show you that one thing, the tenor player... Uh, right here Vroom! right what I wrote for that uh, you know that wasn't necessarily the, the cleanest he he, uh, he actually did that um, differently in rehearsal but this is what's written it's written with a scoop up to that D and so he was trying to lift that scoop up and the reed gave out on him is what happened there but it's a it's it's scooping up to that D and then glissing down. This was written on piano and it was really it was that. But I had him do that and you know he did his version of that. So there's different sounds that can be made like this of bending pitches and uh, you know these glissandos like that. There's all sorts of special effects. There's mutes that brass players can put in to get uh, different kinds of sounds and. Uh, uh, if I go to this uh, piece here, you'll hear some muted, um, here we go, here's muted trumpets here. All right, so that's muted trumpet sound there. And then later on, I can have those trumpets take the mutes out to get a different sound. So there's any number of kind of special effects that different things can do. Flutes can do this thing that a lot of like people who play uh, flute in like a pop rock kind of thing like to do or jazz where you actually sing <laughs> you're like actually singing you're vocalizing through the horn so you get both the sound of the flute and the sound of your vocal cords coming through at once again music score is not going to be able to give you an imitation of that but it's something that flute players can do and so there's all sorts of like special effect sort of things like that so anyhow, the, 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 the notations for all that kind of stuff, the, a lot of them will be found here in the articulations palette. And if you hit more, well, there's no more in there. But so these are some of these sorts of sounds here. Uh, and then also in the arpeggios and glissandi palette, you'll see all these different bends and slides and things and the, the glissandos also, or glissandi, I guess. Um, if I press Z, I get the symbols palette. The symbols palette has just a ridiculous number of symbols. <laughs> uh, it's all I can say about this. And symbols for things you didn't even know were things, uh, but they exist because someone has used them somewhere in notation and a font. There's a, a standard for font symbols called Smoofle, standard music something font layout. Um, so uh, there's a standard for this, and this is a font called Bravora that defines a symbol for every single one of these fonts. So pretty much anything that any engraver, music engraver, has ever called for, there's a symbol for it in Bravora. And you can search it here. So if I want, you know, uh, is squiggle? Yeah, look at that. A bunch of different squiggly lines. Um, uh, so 
I don't know what the sound for, uh, I don't know what that was actually, V-O-C, oh, voce. Um, uh, you know, if there's a particular symbol that's used for the notation you want, if you know the name of the symbol, you can search for it here. If you don't, you can do some Google searches, I guess, or you can just write in directions for it. Yeah, Ian Anderson is definitely one of the people I was thinking about when I talked about uh, um, when I talked about uh, that vocalizing thing. So the thing is, no, there's no specific woodwind palette, but check this out. Add palettes. I'll say create a custom palette, and I'm going to call it wood wind boom and now maybe i side you know i like uh all these guys i'm gonna drag some of these in here oops i didn't quite get it ah. i'm struggling maybe oh maybe it's because this is open i don't know um so i can drag these things in uh and add them to my woodwind palette uh, except that I'm struggling to do that right now. And I, I, I always use this excuse that when I'm broadcasting my broadcast, my key, the thing that I'm doing that says that I've just clicked, right? It steals the keystrokes. And so it makes some things like drag and drop not work um, that smoothly. But then I can also take things from my uh, symbols palette. When I press Z, if I do find, oh, I want that squiggle. Um, let me, I can just drag those squiggle things in, right? So, um, now I have a woodwind palette that's got those symbols on it. So you can you can create your own custom palettes really easily and uh, set them up uh, how you want. So uh, those were the things that I want to talk about. I've seen some good comments in here, a couple questions here and there, and um, I hope you find this useful. I, I do play clarinet, I mean, not professionally, but I, at one point, like in high school, college, I was a fair to midland uh, clarinet player, and I write for winds all the time, mostly in a jazz context, so it's a lot of saxophones, trumpets, and trombones, not as much clarinet and flute, but I play clarinet, so I, I, I have a pretty good concept of that. Oboe and bassoon, nah, those are harder for me to deal with a little bit. I mean, yeah, I, I know how to write for winds in general, but I do know that oboe and bassoon have their own special things from the double read and, and what is and how they work. And I don't have great insight into that, but I have decent insight into winds in general from this, from, from my, my own experience. I also have decent experience in writing for strings, even though I do not play a stringed instrument, but I've done enough of writing for string quartet and writing for orchestra and having it played by real musicians and getting to get feedback on it that I, I do, I will give you, uh, I will do a whole session on writing for strings and uh, I will love it if some of you people who are string players can actually be uh, tuning in when I do that. It'll probably be maybe at least a couple weeks from now because I have something else planned for next week. But, um, uh, so that, you know, if I do tell some lies or people have additional insights to share, you can do so. So, uh, when, when creating, uh, parts can, can, uh, can notation details be added without them appearing in the score? So yes, they can. And, uh, the way you do that is by marking them invisible. So normally you don't want that. I mean, normally, and I tell you this as a conductor, I hate it. When I am looking at a score and then people are playing stuff and I'm like, well, why are you playing that? That's not in the score. And they're like, well, it's here in my part. And then I'm like, oh, okay, well, that should have been in the score. That said, yeah, of course, there are situations where there might be certain things that for whatever reason, it makes sense to put in the part and not in the score. It could. I'm just undoing all these changes um, because I don't want to accidentally save over it. So if I decide I want to put a fermata on here uh, for some strange reason... Uh, I can put that fermata in here, and it will show up in the score. But all I have to do is press V, and now it's invisible. So it's invisible only in the score. It's still there in the part. If I don't even want to see it grayed out, it won't print. But if it bothers me to see it, I can turn off the display of invisible items. And now my invisible items don't display. So yes, you can do that. I recommend doing it judiciously, speaking again as a conductor. I don't generally like it when people's parts don't agree with what I'm seeing. Often it's just because there's a typo or a misprint that happened. Um, but especially if there's articulations and things like that, it's uh, there might be a situation where it gets just too messy 
that appear in the score because the score is generally more cluttered because of all the other staves and so sometimes the part might be more specific about that and then the score it might just say simile or something like that so yeah there are any number of special cases for it but anyhow that that's my answer to that question Okay, so I think I am going to uh, wrap up here because, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have any set length for these things, but I, if they go over an hour, I feel like uh, they're too long, so, and, some, and I, and I t typically do that, and I know I've been talking for about an hour. So I think I'm going to wrap up here. So I mentioned that next week I have something uh, else planned. I think what I want to do next week is talk about uh, Chromebooks because, well, with school starting, uh, Running MuseScore on a Chromebook comes up as an issue. I, I do that. I, I'm not on my Chromebook right now because, unfortunately, the situation for how I broadcast to YouTube, I still don't have totally worked out that well for, on Chromebook. I have a way of doing it, but I'm not as happy with it as the way that on my Windows computer. Um, but I do, I, I literally have not touched this Windows computer since last Wednesday. I do everything on my Chromebook, all my software develop, well, most of my software development, as well as my actual MuseScore work, as well as everything else that I do in teaching. Um, and I want people to really see how viable using MuseScore and incorporating it into a Chromebook workflow is. Um, now, I realize that not many people watching regularly are on Chromebooks, so it won't just be about Chromebooks. It'll be about how I incorporate MuseScore into this overall flow, but I'm going to do it from the Chromebook so that people can see uh, what's possible, because I do want to demo how you would install MuseScore on a Chromebook and make sure that people who are trying to use MuseScore on Chromebooks will have that ability. So again, the, the, the whole topic isn't just about Chromebook, but it is about incorporating MuseScore into an overall music production workflow. And my idea of what a music production workflow is, is maybe more about music education, I should say, than producing professional recordings. Uh, I know that's a popular idea for a topic. Because I don't do that that much, I'm not feeling like I'm the best person to do that. But I, I will try to find someone to bring in, in as a guest. And then we'll let that person maybe do that. So that's uh, something that I will try to remember. What is a Chromebook? Um, that is a good question. A Chromebook is, um, it's not like an iPad. It is more like a regular laptop, although they do make some that are tablets. Uh, this is my Chromebook here. Um, so it's just a regular laptop, as far as I'm going to look at it. But it's not a Mac. It's not running Mac, and it's not running Mac OS. It is not running Windows. It's basically running Chrome. The Chrome browser is the operating system. The whole thing is basically uh, uh, Chrome. It's like, it's like I, if you think about it, most things that most people do most of the time, you're all doing within the web browser most of the time anyhow. You might run a handful of other programs, but most stuff you do is within a web browser. Um, a Chromebook basically takes that idea and builds a whole computer around it, but then also gives you the ability to do things like run MuseScore, um, which is relatively new, like only for the last year or two has that been viable really only the, even the last year. And the thing is, a lot of people who aren't in the education space are like, okay, well, whatever. Why would I want to do that? I just got a laptop. Chromebooks can be really cheap. And so uh, because they don't have to pay Microsoft or Apple license fees to get to run things, Google make subsidizes this. So people like Google produces their own, but other people produce them. And uh, like, there are good cr new Chromebooks out there for like $200 that are perfectly usable devices. And so school, and you can buy, buy them in bulk discounts. So schools buy them by the thousands for their students to use. And then the students buy them themselves to have them at home because they're so cheap. And so they're really big in the education space. So anyhow, that's, uh, that's one reason I want to talk about it. Uh, that is why I want to talk about it here at the beginning of the school year. Um, will AI ever be uh, considered? So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's different. There's AI and there's AI, right? I mean, already just the chord symbol playback that we have is a form of AI. I mean, it's not a particularly smart one, but it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's not that fancy. But the fact, could you hear that voice leading there? Um, that was good voice leading. And if I actually take this and I take that whole passage, and I do realize chord symbols, um, 
you can see the voice leading was actually good. It put the F chord in an inversion to connect smoothly. Is that that smart? No, not really. It's not that smart. It's just some simple algorithms. But the, the point is AI isn't like an all or nothing thing, right? It's, it's, it's a set of things that can like do things that kind of seem clever. And that's one example of, of this. If there's other particular ones that you're curious about, like algorithmic composition in general, where it might try to, you know, do more than just voice chord symbols for you, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, typically people maybe think about doing as a plug-in. And that's certainly doable also. And uh, that's something we can talk about. So, um, yeah, uh, reasonably priced Chromebooks fast enough for MuseCore development. So uh, you've got a couple of good subjective adjectives in there, reasonably priced and fast enough, right? What I am using here, and so I personally prioritize not speed on my computers. I want silent because for doing music, I, I fan noise and hard drive noise I cannot deal with. Plus, it's like moving parts. They're always the first things that have failed. So I no longer buy machines that have moving parts in them. I will not buy a machine with a physical hard drive or with a fan. So I prioritize fanless models. And so that limits things a little bit. So the, the model that I have here is a Pixelbook Go, uh, which is, I want to say, somewhere around 700 new. Is that reasonably priced? Well, among the realm of uh, um, Windows computers, it might seem so. It's on the it's the it's one of the most one of the more expensive Chromebooks though. Um, is it fast enough for MuseCore development? Sure. Is it the fastest machine I've ever developed on? No, no, not at all. But it's 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 fast enough. Um, but I could if I didn't want to prioritize the fanless thing, well then absolutely I could get faster machines for cheaper. And uh, so for you know four hundred dollars, say I could get a machine that was actually uh, you know a high a relatively high end Intel processor that uh, would compile about as fast as anything else, and it would be as loud from the fan noise as about anything else. But yeah, absolutely, these, these exist. So I'll talk more about Chromebooks next time, but again, I won't just talk about Chromebooks, I promise. All right, uh, so that was a, a nice long tail on this thing. Oh, I am gonna actually do one other thing. I'm gonna say that I'm officially done here, but I wanna try, can I try it right now? Yeah, I'm gonna try it right now. Um, just because then it saves me the trouble of trying it later. If you're in, if you're still around for this, great. If not, that's great. But what I just did is I picked up my Chromebook here, and I'm going to try to do a remote desktop into my Windows computer and see if I can actually run the cafe from the Chromebook. Because what I, what I what I'm looking at is if I can. If, if I can't really solve the how to do cafe from the Chromebook problem, I mean, I can't, I know how to solve it. But if I don't come up with a solution that I really like, um, I might use this remote desktop thing. You couldn't see what I typed, right? No, of course you can't. Um, so I am now on my Chromebook. <sighs> Look at that. So I see my Chromebook. So. I'm now going to do some things. I'm going to switch windows. I'm doing this on my Chromebook. Uh, where's MuseScore? Oh, shoot. How do I get to... Oh, I can't get to the taskbar. Now, that's curious. So I am remoted into here, but I, I don't know how to get to the Windows taskbar. So that's unfortunate. So that's something I would have to solve if I want to do this. Anyhow, but it is kind of cool, though, that I am sitting here at my Chromebook doing that, but it played it on my Windows computer, which is over here. <laughs> uh, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm turning my computer around, but that's not where the camera is. So yeah, this makes no sense whatsoever. But uh, trust me, it's, it's kind of cool. I'm sitting here with my Chromebook in my lap as a remote control for my Windows computer. So if I could only figure out how to switch windows and things, I could actually do my broadcast with the Chromebook in my lap, even though the real work is being done on my Windows computer. I'll get to explore that a little bit in between now and, and next week. So anyhow, I'm going to have some fun uh, with yet more technical challenges, I'm sure, next week, but whatever. So uh, with uh, that said, I think I'm going to sign off here. So um, thanks for being here. Let me just make a final check, make sure there's no... Uh, final comments that I need to address. Nope. So uh, I will see y'all next week.